Our scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. It's a long passage. Amen. So I want you to patiently go with me to the word uh, because I'm going to read it all. Amen. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 1 through 25. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man inciting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, he stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he began, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether Jesus was a Galilean. And when Pilate learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent Jesus to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. Verse 8, when Herod saw Jesus... He was very glad for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. Verse 9, he questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave Herod no answer. Jesus gave Herod no answer. Verse 10, the chief priest and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on Jesus and sent Jesus back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Y'all ever heard that uh, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Let me read verse 12 again. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people. Said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod. For he sent him back to us. Indeed, Jesus has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Verse 18. Then the people all shouted together, Away with this fellow. Release Barabbas for us. Verse 19, this was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Verse 20, Pilate wanting to release Jesus addressed them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Verse 22, a third time Pilate said to them, why, what evil has Jesus done? I found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I would therefore have him flogged and then release him. Verse 23, but the people kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that Jesus be crucified and their voices prevailed. Verse 24, so Pilate gave his verdict that the people's demands should be granted. Verse 25, Pilate released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And he handed Jesus over as they wished. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Pray with me from the title today, Enemy of the State. Let's pray. God, have your way. Do what you want to do in this preaching moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So y'all, the passage that I just read, I read in its totality for a reason. I think that we often get accustomed to the story of Jesus going to the cross and we take for granted how much crazy stuff was actually happening, right? Like, like, like we get to the point where we recognize that Jesus had to die and Jesus had to fulfill the promise and Jesus is going to be resurrected. And, and, and sometimes we rush past the human injustice that takes place against Jesus 
by both leadership and the crowds. And today, I titled today's sermon, Enemy of the State, because I want us to wrestle with what does it look like when you, unbeknownst to you, you over there minding your business, and the way that you are living your life becomes a threat to powers that be. In 1998, some of y'all weren't born, but in 1998, Will Smith was in a movie called Enemy of the State. Now, just help me. Like, if you heard of Enemy of the State, the movie, can you wave at me just so I know who's in here? All right, we got a few, we got a few folks. We got a few folks. Shout out to the older millennials like me who were good in, in middle school. I thought I was grown. I was good and grown in middle school when Enemy of the State came out. And um, this movie is all about Will Smith, who's just like this, this lawyer, right? This just normal, everyday guy. He's got a nice house. He's got a family. He's got a good career. Um, and he runs into someone who has become an enemy of the government, right? Uh, the movie starts off where you literally see uh, a senator being killed, um, um, and it's caught on tape. And the person who catches it on tape doesn't realize what he caught. He's a bird watcher. So he thinks he's just watching birds, right? He presses play on the tape, realizes, wow, I just witnessed a murder of a senator. And while everybody on the television is saying this person died by accident, I have proof that it's not the case, right? That's the plot of the movie. The government realizes this, this, this random person has video of the murder, and they're trying to track down this video so that it's not exposed um, this man was killed. The man was killed for greater political power, um, et cetera, et cetera. What happens is the person who does the, uh, the recording on their video, uh, back then it was a camera, but think now, 2022 would have been on your phone, right? Uh, the, the person who does the recording, uh, he gets found out, and before they can kill him, he runs into Will Smith in a store and gives Will Smith the video unbeknownst to Will Smith, right? The government still kills this man, but then they realize the man doesn't have the video anymore. Will Smith has the video, and now Will Smith, this innocent person, becomes quite literally an enemy of the government, and they begin to strip him. They shut down his, his debit cards, his credit cards. They break into his house. They lie on his family. They get him fired from his job. It's just like, it's like Joel, right? It's like, it's like Joel, but Will Smith. Um, and, and he becomes an enemy of the government, even though he is innocent, and for half the movie, he doesn't even know why the government's following him. He doesn't realize he has the tape. And the other half of the movie, he realizes he has the tape. They're following him, so forth and so on. He's an enemy of the state. I want to submit to us that Jesus, too, was an enemy of the state. Jesus is a Galilean. Jesus grew up in the hood. Y'all done heard me preach about that. Nazareth was the hood, okay? Jesus is not a Roman citizen. Rome is the place of power. Rome is where we find Jesus, while Pilate, the person in charge, is trying to figure out what to do with Jesus. Jesus has become an enemy of the state. And what we read in these past 25 verses is a conversation between two people who are not really impressed with Jesus, but they want to see who Jesus is for themselves. And I want to pause here real quick because every now and again, you out there living your life, you haven't done anything to anybody, but because you are living your life well and people are speaking of you, every now and again, folks want to get in your presence just to see if your rep is as good as what they say it is. Be careful on your way up, on whatever ladder it is you're climbing professionally, of people who want to get in your space just to see if you're really about all the hype. If, if people are around you trying to test you, trying to make you prove that you're as good in your profession as the streets say you are, be careful because you're not safe. Because anytime somebody brings you into their space simply to test you to see if you're good enough for them, your answer will never be good enough. Because they brought you in under a state of suspicion. I have a subtitle for this sermon. It is Suspicion 
surveillance, and safety. Enemy of the state. Suspicion, surveillance, and safety, right? Jesus ends up going under surveillance by Pilate and Herod. Two leaders that hate each other, but because they're so interested in Jesus, who's made all this noise by healing and by doing all these works that everybody is talking about, now these two enemies become friends because they try to figure out, is Jesus really all that they say Jesus is? Jesus has become an enemy of the state simply by doing what God called him to do. Some of us, the more you walk in your calling, the more you get called into rooms to prove yourself. <laughs> yes. You ever got them text messages and them phone calls? Hey, can you meet us over here? We just want to see something. We, we trying to see something. Can you, uh, can you, can you, can you, can you? But here, watch it. Jesus passes their test. Y'all see it in the text? Herod and Pilate, who both really want to prove that Jesus ain't really all that, are both like, we find nothing wrong with this man. We find no incongruities. We find no issues with him. He appears to be who he says he is. We wanted to find that he was a fraud. We wanted to find something where we like, yo, we exposed your man's Jesus like he ain't who we thought he was. But we couldn't find anything. Right, right. And I want to pause here because every now and again when you become an enemy to powers that be, even when they examine you and find nothing wrong, they're still not done. Earlier this year, we, we preached through grow tales. We preached through still growing. We braced ourselves for what was next. We celebrated about what was next. Many of you are in your next right now. It would take the rest of the sermon to name the testimonies in this room alone in the past month. But while you are in this portion of your testimony, you've got to be aware that every time you go up another level, you attract some other devils. You attract some other enemies. You attract some surveillance. Got more eyes on your stories. Got more folks looking, not liking. Got more people screenshotting your business and texting it around, but they didn't say nothing to you. Every time you go up another level, you're under more surveillance. And the more you are surveilled, the more you become the object of somebody's desire or frustration. They either want to be like you or they can't stand you. And in our text today, we find that Pilate and Herod, initially, we're not clear if they do or don't like Jesus, right? Let me, let me Herod, this is, this, is, this is not the Herod that wanted to kill Jesus when Jesus was born. This is his son. Okay, that Herod was Herod the Great, right? So time has passed. But this Herod is like, oh, I've heard of this Jesus. I want to see him do something. It's in your text. He says, I, 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 I heard about Jesus. I would love for Jesus to show some sign. Jesus doesn't do it. Jesus is unwilling to perform while Jesus is being surveilled. Okay? You do not have to perform for anyone that does not have your best interest at heart. Black people, you do not have to perform for oppressors that don't want to do anything positive for you. You do not have to perform simply because you are being surveilled. Because guess what? They're going to surveil you either way. 
You do not have to give people data about yourself just because they're trying to act like they don't know who you are. If they didn't want to know, if they didn't already know who you were, they wouldn't be talking to you in the first place. They know who you are. They know what you can do. And Jesus is at the near end of his ministry. Jesus has performed signs and wonders. Jesus has performed miracles. Jesus has folks who can testify of his goodness, of the fact that he is the Messiah. Jesus has already rolled down uh, the road where they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Jesus don't have to prove himself. He's already proven himself. They already know who Jesus is. And yet, Jesus finds himself as an enemy of the state. Under surveillance, under suspicion, without safety. Under surveillance, under suspicion, without safety. This week in our nation, it has felt like we were under surveillance, under suspicion, and without safety. Do y'all understand how the Supreme Court works? Supreme Court only gets the highest level cases that the local courts can't solve, okay? You know when you were a kid and you try to do, just figure out a dispute between you and when y'all couldn't figure it out, you call somebody's big brother, big sister, you call your mama, you call somebody else who's like, okay, okay, they gonna tell y'all what it really, since you won't listen to me, let me get my big brother. Supreme Court is America's big brother, big sister. The only cases that get to the Supreme Court, matter of fact, lawyers fight for their courses to even be accepted by the Supreme Court to be decided upon. And so these cases that get to the Supreme Court are already under a particular level of a microscope. They're already being watched. The Supreme Court has to Render all of their decisions by the end of June, okay? This week, we experienced several decisions rendered by the Supreme Court, okay? It is not an accident that we got several decisions in one week. They have until June to tell us what they're doing. On the big cases that the local folks can't solve. Y'all with me? So this week, the Supreme Court ruled on Thursday that Miranda rights would no longer have the same level of authority that they used to have. What that means is individuals who are stopped by police now are no longer able to sue police officers if they are not read their Miranda right, which gives them the right to remain silent. Y'all see it in verse 10 where they asked Jesus all these questions and Jesus said nothing. There is power in your silence. You do not have to perform when you're under surveillance. The Supreme Court ruled on Thursday that they, that officers can no longer be held uh, to a greater standard of having to let you know you don't have to say anything. You have the right to remain silent. Supreme Court also decided in the 5-4 ruling this week that they would strike down the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that federally protected a woman's right to have an abortion. Supreme Court also, this week, struck down a New York gun law that we've had on the books for over a century. That gun law used to place restrictions on being able to carry a concealed handgun outside of the home. That is no longer the case. There are other cases, but for the sake of time, I will put those three cases before us. The past few days, we've learned that New Yorkers can walk around with a handgun, and it's all right. We've learned that cops can stop us and not really read us our rights, and it's all right. And we've learned 
that the federal government no longer has a say in what individual states can decide about a woman's right to choose in one week. Surveillance, suspicion, and safety. And when you have all that happen in one week, it can make you feel like an enemy of the state. Help us, help us. Is anybody protecting me? Does anybody care if I live or I die? Are my taxes going towards anything that's going to help me? Marvin Gaye said, makes me want to holler, throw up both my hands. Our grandparents and parents are looking at things that they marched for, that they struggled for, that they got their answers for, be unraveled before their eyes. Makes us feel like enemies of the state. And so I'm here not with answers today, but I'm here to let you know that Jesus too found himself as an enemy of the state. Jesus, too, was walking around doing the work of the Lord and was flogged. And there were no uh, things they could prove uh, that he was doing uh, incorrectly or against the law. And yet and still, the people still wanted to crucify him. The word of the Lord for you today is, regardless of what the state does, regardless of what the nation does, regardless of what the world does, regardless of if you are as innocent as Will Smith in that movie who had no idea of what he had, or as clear as the man who caught it on tape and didn't mean to, regardless of whether you are like Jesus or Barabbas, regardless of who you are and where you find yourself, you as a child of God still have the right to safety even if the powers that be that are supposed to protect you choose not to. You are still worthy of safety. You are still worthy of choice. And what we're seeing in our nation right now reminds me so much of what we saw of Jesus in those verses in Luke chapter 23. Nothing would satisfy the people other than a crucified Jesus. Didn't matter if Jesus was right or wrong. Didn't matter if Herod and Pilate, even though they didn't like Jesus, couldn't find anything wrong with them. Did not matter. The people wanted to crucify Jesus. But was Jesus second guessing the miracles he did? Was Jesus second guessing the purpose he lived? Was Jesus second guessing the reason why he was there? No, Jesus kept his mouth shut. Jesus was like, I'm not even going to perform for you. I'm not going to let you surveil me. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise because I see what this is. You see me as your enemy. And when people are committed to making you the fall person for whatever it is they trying to advance, don't even waste your breath trying to prove them otherwise. The people wanted Jesus crucified, period. Fifty years of advocacy have landed us in the repealing of not only these three things this week, but voting rights are under attack. And all of these civil rights that we fought for are under attack. And there's other things that could also be under attack based on this thing getting pushed forward. And y'all, it ain't about you. It's not about your humanity. It's not about how much you can persuade them of how good a person you are or how much you prove you should be protected or how much you... No, what it's about is an agenda that's bigger than you so you may as well try to figure out how do I live in the midst of it now that I recognize they see me as their enemy y'all right. right. ask us why we are a Jesus movement for black lives why y'all talking about black lives and justice and all that because I can't rub this black off can I? I don't want to 
But um, I'm black. I'm literate. I use my mouth. I am a threat. I am an enemy of the state. I'm not going to let you treat my people any old kind of way if I can help it. But here's what I want to show us. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Here's what I want to show us. Jesus does all of his advocacy before he goes before the state. Watch it. Jesus does all his miracles, all his signs, all his wonders. Jesus subverts systems. Jesus turns over tables, turns water into wine. Jesus does all the stuff that Jesus wants to do before he gets in front of the state. When he gets in front of the state, he's quiet and he lets them do what they're going to do. You know what that says to me? It says to me that our work is not about just trying to prove our humanity to folks who don't see us as human. Our work is about trying to make sure human beings that look like us have what they need regardless of what the state will or will not do. Our work is to be the bridge between somebody who can't eat and someone who can. Our work is to be the intercessor in the hospital room after someone is dying of an illness because they don't have any health care. Our work is to be the individuals who will shout out loud about what we see and about what needs to be done. Our work is to push folks to see things another way. That's why we protest. That's why we march in the streets. That's why we call on the name of Jesus. But you don't have to do everything. So I'm, whoever's still watching us on, the, on stream, just type in the comments, you don't have to do everything. And you do not have to perform. Jesus recognizes that he is an enemy of the state. He is an enemy of the Roman government. That the people need him to be on a platter. Jesus realizes where this is going. And Jesus knows that even in the midst of all of this chaos, even in the midst of him being lied on, even in the midst of them trying to set him up, that God the Father was still working it together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. Can I tell you some of the good that I see in this moment and then I'm done? The good that I see is systems being exposed. The good that I see is people who were asleep because they felt like we got a black president and a black vice president, we're good, are realizing that other things are at stake. People who would have never thought that certain things could be rolled back are living through an alternate experience. And it is my hope that in our seeing these uh, elements being exposed, that we don't hide in a corner, but that we recognize that our work is not done, that we recognize that people are living through hardship, not just because they can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but because there are literally systems who've been working decades to strip us of the very thing we need for our own protection. The good that I see is that things are in the open that used to be behind closed doors. And if you have enough people who are clear about what's happening behind closed doors and unwilling to accept what's happening behind closed doors, then you end up with enough folks to create a counter reality regardless of what the state has to do. That's where you get mutual aid. Maybe you didn't get a raise on your job, but I'm gonna slide you something so you can get some groceries. That's where you get people creating our own ways of checking in on one another. 
that's where you get people being aware of what they need. Hey, they may not tell you this, but you don't have to speak when they arrest you. That's when you get people being willing to stand in the gap. And so, y'all, we may feel like enemies of the state right now because the decisions that are being made are not in the people's best interest. But it is my hope and my prayer that we will realize there are more of us than there are of them. And we can rally together and take care of one another. People of every race, people of every economic class. Last Saturday, Pastor Andrew, Ken, Miles, and myself traveled to D.C. for the Poor People's Campaign. And it is a revival of a campaign that uh, William Barber and Liz Theo Harris have revived. But it was some of the work that Martin Luther King Jr. was doing just before he was killed. And it literally brings together white poor people, black poor people, Latinx poor people, Asian poor people, indigenous poor people, anybody who's been impacted by systems and structures to tell their stories and to realize there are more of us than there are of them. 99% is a whole lot stronger than 1%. And what, when you feel like an enemy of the state, you feel like you're the only enemy. You don't realize that other folks are being impacted. That's why I named three things that happened this week and not just one. Because there is intersectional harm happening. But if the friend, but if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then the friend of the person who also is in need, and I'm in need, is also my ally. Because if we all are in need, we should be able to come together and advocate for one another. I want to pray for us because the next few months are going to be very challenging. But my prayer is that we will, as we started this service, continue to speak the name of Jesus, continue to believe that things can still change, that there's still power in the name of Jesus. My secondary prayer is that we will understand the power of coming together. That even if they crucify us, even if we get nailed to a cross, even if we get killed, resurrection is around the corner. Ascension is around the corner. The comforter is around the corner. Protection is among us. Safety is within us. Government won't protect us, we'll protect each other. Government don't care about us, we care about each other. And I just believe that what they meant for evil, God's going to turn it around for our good. Because there are more of us than there are of them. I encourage you to pick up the phone and call somebody this weekend before the weekend ends. Ask them how they're doing with this news. I don't know where they saw it, but from the shade room to the New York Times, the news was out there. Pick up the phone. Yo, like, do you feel like an enemy of the state right now? Because I do. Do you feel safe right now? Because I don't. So what do we need to do to feel safe? What protection do we need? What allyship do we need? Who do we need to talk to? What do we need to pray about? 
call somebody. You will be surprised that folks who seem like they're not paying attention, those are the folks that have the facts right off of the tip of their tongue. They don't even have to look it up. They know it. Everyone's not talking. Some folks are choosing to be silent, but they're watching. Call somebody. FaceTime somebody. Voice note somebody. Take the pulse of your intimate community and then figure out how we create safety where we don't perform while we're under suspicion or surveillance. We remember that even when Jesus was innocent and was still handed over to the state, that it didn't end there. It ends in his resurrection, his ascension, and the birth of the church. And this will not end here. Y'all hear me? This will not end here. They've awakened too many folks that were asleep. On the other side of this is revolution. On the other side of this is resistance. On the other side of this is resilience like we've never seen before. Let's pray. Revolutionary Jesus. We need you to show us the way in a time where we feel unsafe. Show us the way in a time where things that we took for granted have changed up on us. Show us the way. In a time where we feel like enemies of a system, even though we've been innocently living our lives, minding our business, show us the way. The way forward. The way towards goodness. The way towards restoration the way towards safety. Point us in the direction that you would have us go. And God, help us not to go by ourselves, but let us go together as a community. God, we stand in the gap for anyone who fears for their lives right now because of decisions that have been made that they have no say-so in. Protect them, Lord. Keep them safe. Show them a way out. God, we ask in this time of uncertainty that you would be our strong tower that we can run into and find our safety. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.